current and future role of GeoInt uh, in a variety of areas, as it says up here. Uh, to save some time, we can simplify this. This is 5% uh, of the flight information publications worldwide. This is the current role. This is the future role. Anybody have any questions? No? Uh, actually, we will come back to the flip example. You know, we've got a statutory uh, responsibility for flight information publications. Uh, we produce about 10 million of those a year. They cost about $2 each. So $20 million in flight information publications that we update every 28 days, which means you have to update them every 28 days. Uh, and that's just a bad business model for the future role. So later on this morning, we're going to do a demo, because what I want to talk about is how the role of GON has to change uh, going forward. Uh, GON is, as, uh, as General Thomas talked about, it is kind of a foundational thing. He referred to Vanessa Lawrence saying everything happens somewhere. Uh, now just as another way of example, uh, how many of you flew to come to the conference? Show of hands. I can see some of my American colleagues haven't quite made the time change yet because I suspect you probably did fly to get here. How many of you printed your boarding pass, or how, let's rephrase it, how many of you had an electronic boarding pass when you got on the plane? Now in five years, I think every one of us is going to have to, we'll all be raising our hand at that point because what that's doing is that becomes an electronic record. That actually is going to become a GeoInt electronic record because not only you think you're just saying, this is how I want to get on the plane, they're going to say, this person at this time with this device which was purchased at this location, who checked in at this location, and we will know everything about that boarding pass by the time you actually get on the plane. And so that becomes an evolving role of GeoInt going forward. You know, as a community, we want to start to take advantage of some of these technologies. And so the future really is maps to apps. Um, here, some of the flight information publications, this is historically the way that we have done things. I want to draw your attention to this diagram down here uh, in the center uh, uh, bottom of that. That's actually a search and rescue map from, uh, produced by FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Association, as they were doing search and rescue. That's the way they were doing it. And so one of the other things that we'll talk about today is there really has to be a better way to do that. Uh, our director, uh, Ms. Letitia Long, uh, she's, uh, she's been in uh, the, the head of the agency now for about 18 months, came out with a new vision which talked about what she really wants to do is to put the power of GON in your hands. And it doesn't matter whether we're talking about an, an iPad, an Android device, a mobile phone. Even on this right-hand side here, you see a secure mobile device. We actually are doing this today in Afghanistan. People have uh, uh, eye touches or they have uh, secure Android devices in something we call the, uh, the iPix where they take that out, the provincial reconstruction teams take that out into the field so that they can use that to have the current GeoInt data that's representative. That's her vision, is putting the power of GeoInt in hands. It has two constituent parts to that, one of which is online on-demand access. And again, this is nothing new to people uh, who, uh, who have this in the commercial sector today with the apps. Uh, but doing this for uh, the national uh, environment or doing this for security is something as one of the questions asked, you know, how do we get the security people in board? Or as Guy Thomas asked, how do we do this with open source? How do we do this for the other activities? Right now, since we started uh, going forward with online on-demand access to GeoInt, uh, we've added about 150 apps to our app store for this. And again, I'm going to actually try to show the live demos this morning to walk you through this. Now, uh, some of my staff questions is, why in the world would you possibly want to do a live demo 
uh, of these apps during this show. And I'm thinking, so let me get this straight. We're going to go through and put this in the hand of somebody that's searching for somebody in a collapsed building, and we're concerned that I'm going to use it on stage. Or we're going to go through and give this to a pilot who's flying at 38,000 feet at 525 miles an hour with 300 of his closest friends over heavily populated places, and we're worried about doing this in the secure confines of the QE2 conference center. Or more importantly, we're gonna give this to a soldier in a brigade and somehow there's a concern. The worst thing that's gonna to happen today is if I do these demos that doesn't work is I may get a little embarrassed, but nobody will die. And so as we talk about moving to online on-demand access, we actually want to show that to change the paradigm. Uh, a key, second key point of this though is the broader deeper analytic expertise. Uh, again, General Thomas talked about this uh, in great detail when he talked about the multi-int environment, the cross-int environment, talked about the human geography layer. You know, it's the fundamental questions that we've been trying to, to answer is where is my enemy? Or where is safety? Or where is the bridge out? And, and what we've been able to do to date is we're really pretty good at telling you where things were and we're not so good at telling you where things are and even more of a challenge is well, where are things going to be what, and to try to get it predictive and so it's a matter of taking an, an observation and translating that forward and the way that you can do that with much more success is by shortening the cycle time, the, si the perishability of information, the fact that something you recorded from an image that was taken 12 hours ago or 16 hours ago has a decay rate. And it's probably not as accurate and not as current unless it's a fixed asset, which is generally easier to track than the mobile assets. And so by going with broader and deeper analysis, this idea that we're going to record observations. That's how when uh, one of the examples that I'll be using later in the week on Thursday with the uh, uh, Fukushima and the nuclear uh, disaster that happened there, uh, the currency of the information really came from the people on the ground. And so that was the cornerstone of actually getting into broader and deeper analytics. So at this point, what, uh, as we begin to correlate information, uh, I want to go through and talk and actually show you the flip demo and how we're replacing all of these books with something totally different. And so we can switch over to this. Uh, what we're going to show here is that this is our iPad application in December. Uh, we're actually going to, uh, December we release this, we're going to come out and release it on the Android devices. But here is the complete set of FLIMP information that's on here. And so planning, I wanted them to lay in the route from uh, Washington Dulles to Heathrow, and so we started that. And so in my end flight here, what we actually have is the approach charts for Dulles on here on this that the pilot can have with them and we can also go through and say that's the airport what is the departure route well you go out something called the capital eight uh, route and you go through and you have all these different vectors that you fly they wouldn't actually let me fly the plane with this i was somewhat disappointed but uh, uh, we actually took the route going out the potomac departure north route and then uh, we could go through and along the way, the en route planning activities, you, were, uh, you actually go out the different vectors and everything that the pilots wanted to know is actually in this. The contact information for Dulles Tower, for ground uh, control, for the Potomac approach control here. Uh, if we had been flying, when we go back in, we'll probably come in uh, through either Martinsburg or, or one of the other locations and be able to come into this. We can also go through and uh, there's different 
charts here. And so this is actually the chart for Washington uh, uh, coming in on the vectors from Philadelphia, getting down here into the whole D.C. area, which is fairly tightly controlled, coming by Fort Meade. There's something up there at Fort Meade. I don't remember exactly what it is. Uh, and then you get into Washington, you have the whole chart here. Uh, you can go across all the different pubs that you have here, all the AP1, this big book that we had here that's like 500 pages. I can look at this, or we have the whole thing here, and we can go through, and it tells us everything that's in the book. This is going to save us money, but more importantly, the currency of this information is going to be dr dramatically improved. The, the next demo that we'll do is, and actually I won't go to the slide just to save time, is let's talk about the disaster activities. This is something we do a, a fair amount. Um, and so disaster atlas are things that we produce uh, anytime there's a, a hurricane, a tropical storm, or something like this. We used to be able to print about 200 of these an hour. We can do 6,000, I'm sorry, 200 a day. We can do 6,000 of these in an hour now. And uh, this is actually off the coast of Florida. And so what we actually can have here is we can have the pre-disaster uh, atlas, which shows not just the map information about this, but it shows the street information and then shows you the location as well as everything that's in this particular grid. And then you can go back, if I type this right, uh, and then see after it's been updated uh, what the uh, what the post-disaster atlas actually looks like. And one of the, again, one of the challenges of uh, live demos, but if I go back down to the same area and say, well, what does the updated disaster atlas look like? So in case we want to have the situational awareness of what has been destroyed, and this is live, this is actual data from the folks that went out in the field to record this, uh, it shows they, they're updating it live using another app on here that uh, we, can, uh, we can show as well. And by the end of the day, we have far better situational awareness in terms of what is the actual uh, uh, damage that's done. Okay, so I guess we're running into network congestion. Uh, let's go back to this. Uh, if in the idea of making every sensor uh, a shooter, we can go through, we have uh, the uh, search and, 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 and rescue maps here. And so uh, people can go in, and if I go actually to here, it's going to bring up. Uh, uh, London, where we are right now, and we, as people are walking around the field, the way that they record this is they create events which show up here, and those red events get tracked back, and John talked about these going into the cloud. Well, they're actually being stored at a database that's actually back in the state, and so this was an event that we actually recorded this morning that there's something going on here at the QE2 Center. Uh, so, uh, a variety of different disaster activities here that we could show as, as well. Uh, one other demonstration that I wanted to show was in terms of uh, humanitarian relief. Uh, we actually are using this as well. We have about 500 image product libraries in the field today. And they're at various locations uh, at the battalion level. Uh, different command, specific command has like 28 of them. European command has some number. They're in every Army DCGS system, Air Force DCGS system. Uh, several of them in Afghanistan, several of them in 
uh, 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 other areas around the world, and they're very good for different, uh, different techniques, but what they're not particularly good at is providing an in integrated view of the information management. And so we're actually replacing that. We've got a program underway. We haven't begun to replace any of them yet, but uh, we awarded it this summer to replace it with something called the iStore, uh, just as a play on words with the Apple technique. And so we're actually going to start rolling out replacements for that. Uh, now this is on a... Uh, Yeah, wrong device. <laughs> Thanks. Sorry. Uh, this is what we're going to be replacing our IPLs with. This is a Windows tablet. And so in here, we will have the ability to do very simple searches. If I can bring up the keyboard here. And so uh, using public domain data, I think Guy had talked about open source uh, data. We'll look up data for the Haiti earthquake, and it'll pull in information, again, from the cloud, because the people doing this don't really care or know where it's at. And so this is a uh, uh, pre-earthquake satellite image. Let's see if we can bring this up. And you have the same basic capability, but not only can you do this for... Uh, just imagery, you can go through and do this for uh, other types of information, uh, whether they're PDFs, TIFF, open source report, the search capability. In this case, we're bringing in a PDF and uh, has different information on here, uh, the, both before the earthquake, after the earthquake. I could go through and say, hey, I just want to look at PDFs. I don't have an image viewer. I just want to look at JPEG images. The search option up here would let me do more under the advanced search. I could go through, um, and there's different, I can say I only want to look at, say, commercial imagery versions of this, and it would resort that. And so now uh, I've got pre and post satellite uh, uh, data here. And so these things here are the future of what that we're trying to do. And I think in the interest of time, I'm going to be doing some other demos later this week. And there's a lot more I could, I could go through. I could have this actually show up on the Google Earth thing live. But uh, in the interest of time, uh, I'll save that for another point later in the week. Uh, and just a couple of summary comments that I, that I want to make. Thanks. Uh, first, uh, you know, we're really trying to change the face of GeoInt. Uh, um, let's see, let's go on to this slide. Data is a commodity. There's, there's more content that's created uh, every day than we can possibly imagine. In our image libraries, I, I tell people, you saw General Thomas's chart that had you know, all those collectors over uh, Iraq. We actually collect more data in three weeks in one area than we collected from now going back to the 1700s, including all the dirigibles. And so, uh, the, you know, the next presenter is going to be talking to you about the challenges of big data, and I don't want to get into that, but we've got to find ways to exploit that data. Apps have got to be as equally available. Users, they're not just consumers anymore. They're actually creating content. We give those devices out to the field. Yes, they're using the data, but as they're doing search and rescue and they're marking off, instead of on that little hand-drawn piece of paper where they've been, they're creating content. They're collaborating with each other. They're going through and sharing information. That event that I created over the QE2 Conference Center, when I shared that, it was available anywhere, anywhere to anyone. Uh, and so collaboration and integration, it's not something that's a nice to have anymore. It's actually a mission necessity. And so uh, because of those three realities in that, uh, what 
what we have to do are change, and that's why maps are becoming apps. Because a map, it's a static piece of content, and it reflected a view at a point in time. Even if I update it every 28 days, that means within minutes, it's, it's out of date uh, for the flip charts. Uh, we do notice to Mariners every seven days, <laughs> but as soon as I publish them, they're out of date. And so by doing this online on demand, it's a lot better. We're going to continue to work as a collective GeoInt community. It is about just the base GeoInt data. It's about the open source GeoInt data. It's about taking all the Twitter feeds and analyzing them during an Arab Spring so that we know what really is going on in different places around the world. Uh, and it's no longer about producing discrete products. It's about letting you define the products you need. Every, I, I didn't get a chance to show that, but I could have created our, what my own product was in any of those things. I could have gone through and tailored it to be just what I wanted with the symbology, and we'll show some more of that later on the week. It is really about trying to understand the world, uh, and, and that's really what uh, the director wants to do. And so what I'll do is uh, have time for any questions, maybe a question. Okay, we'll take questions at the end. So, that's it then. Thanks so much.